Dear colleagues and friends, uh, welcome to the last lecture of the series lectures. Uh, uh, Tim Williams uh, discuss his own philosophy. Uh, tonight, he will talk his new thinking about the a pre or uh, post or distinction. Then, yes. Uh, Tim, please. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. So, let, first of all, let me share my screen. Um, so, um, and Okay, um, thank you. So this this um, is the the last of the eight uh, lectures, and it's it's going to be on um, various uh, thoughts about the epistemological uh, distinction between the uh, the a priori and the a posteriori. At least I'll pronounce it that way. Some people say a priori, a posteriori, but I'll say a priori, a posteriori. Um, so, it, it, in this lecture, I, I will discuss how I arrived at my present attitude towards the distinction between the a priori and the a posteriori, and and of uh, various uh, issues which are uh, related uh, to that. Um, so, m my discussion of these matters, uh, it. Uh, resulted um, in a book that I published um, last year called Debating the uh, A Priori, um, which was co-authored uh, with uh, Paul Bogosian, who's a professor at New York University, um, and co-authored in a slightly unusual way because um, it, it's a series of exchanges between us. I, I wrote about, uh, in total, about half the book. He, he wrote... Uh, the the other half of the book, and and we disagreed and uh, still disagree about most of the questions at issue. And in fact, uh, actually, this is an ongoing uh, exchange. So um, each of us has has written um, some some further, um, as it were, chapters of of this uh, exchange, which which are more recent than the. Uh, the book and and what I say will will uh, uh, to some extent uh, reflect that. But I think I mean neither of us has basically changed our mind in in a way. We've just each of us has simply developed our our own position um, further. Um, but perhaps if anything, becoming further apart, not 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 closer together. Um, so. I want to go back to um, to a much earlier in my career, just very briefly to to mention some engagements I've had with this distinction. Um, so um, before I started on the um, some of the research that uh, went into um, the, the philosophy of philosophy, which came out in two thousand and seven, I was quite happy to work with the. Um, a priori, uh, a posteriori uh, distinction. I mean, it wasn't something that I did so much work on, but but it it was one that I was willing to uh, to use. It, it, um, so I was less I was less negative about it than then than I am now. Um, and just to give an example, I I published a short article on potential um, Cartesian cases of the contingent a priori um, of. Uh, knowledge in in 1986. Um, so these are examples like um, thinking is happening or something like that, w w uh, which seem to have some quality of the a priori about them. I mean, after all, if you if you think that thinking is happening, um, then it is happening. <laughs> Um, and so just thinking the thought thinking is happening uh, is enough to guarantee that it's uh, true. And so this is 
Uh, this is very similar um, to um, Descartes' um, I think, therefore I, I am. And so that seems like a case of a priori knowledge. That, um, but, I mean, we, but, I mean, we, we could have, there could be an argument about that, but I, but I, I argued that it, that it really was a case of a priori knowledge, as long as you came to the, that conclusion in the, the right way. Um, but it also seems to be uh, contingent because the universe could have uh, evolved in such a way that um, no thinking creatures ever occurred. Um, and so no, no thinking ever happened. I, I mean, that's that's metaphysically possible, it seems. So that would all that would be an example of the contingent uh, a priori, but of a somewhat different kind from those which um, Kripke and and others uh, discussed. I was so I was arguing that it was a more widespread phenomenon, but but I wasn't questioning the category of the a priori. I was just. Um, as it were, giving more examples to reinforce Kripke's point that, that how, about how different a distinction, the epistemological distinction between the a priori and the a posteriori is, different kinds of knowledge, compared to the metaphysical distinction between uh, contingent and necessary. Um, now, of course, the, the kind of standard way of explaining um, the distinction uh, is uh, to say that a priori knowledge is uh, independent of experience, whereas a posteriori knowledge de uh, depends on experience. By the way, um, people like Paul Bogosian, um, who approach epistemology in a different way that I'll talk about more later, um, for them, the, the most important epistemological distinction is not so much between having knowledge and not having knowledge, but between having justified belief and not having justified belief. And so for them, it would be primarily a distinction between different types of justification. But the things I'm going to say are not um, very sensitive to uh, to whether we, we're talking about knowledge or justification, the kind of similar consideration uh, apply to both. Um, so as I say, it, it, it's a distinction between what's independent of experience and, or, and what depends on experience, roughly speaking. Um, but, but I mean, I, uh, you know, I was certainly aware of complications in making the idea of dependence and experience precise in appropriate ways to give the kind of distinction that is intended. But I was just hoping that, that these um, problems could be uh, re resolved. Um, so, um, an, an example to just to illustrate the way in which um, the, it, it's not such a straightforward uh, distinction as you might think is, um, you know, we we know that red is more similar to orange than to yellow. These kind of um, color relations and and the knowledge of that sort of of those color relations is usually classified as a priori. But of course, you know, by, on standard views, we do need sense experience even to understand the words red, orange, and yellow. And so it seems that even with that a priori knowledge, um, some sense experience is playing, you know, a, a necessary role, even in that knowledge. Um, because if we didn't understand the words, we couldn't, uh, or well, some words with, that made this distinction, we, we wouldn't be able to know that, that red is more similar to orange than to yellow. Um, now, the, I mean, of course, uh, you know, m many philosophers have been aware of this, and the, the, the usual fix that they introduce is to distinguish between the role of experience in enabling us to understand the questions and the different role of experience um, in providing us with evidence um, which we can use to answer the uh, the questions. So th that's what we would they would say about um, the role that experience is is playing in an example like this one about color relations. Um, and and so as it, I think somebody. Has to, 
somebody needs to turn their um their sound off because uh, we're getting some interference um so it so the way that they would as it were more fully explain the the distinction is something like this that a priori knowledge is independent of experience yeah. in its essential role but may depend on experience in its enabling role that's a dependence on experience with those examples about color relation um whereas a posteriori knowledge depends on experience in its evidential role so it's only uh, that evidential role which is the what makes the difference between the a priori and the a posterior not other sorts of um roles uh, for uh, experience, the one's called enabling. Um, and another issue, of course, requires clarification, um, is um, exactly what the range of, um, of cases that where the, the word experience is being understood to apply to. Uh, so, for example, you know, does does experience um, include uh, non-sensory experience, uh, for example, the uh, experience of of going through a mathematical proof in your head. Just um, so, so those were, were those were kind of issues where it, it, the distinction um, needed some at least some kind of tidying up and further clarification. But but th they. They did did not seem like as a killer. So they they did not seem like cases which which um, undermined you know it, its use um, as you know a, a fairly basic distinction in epistemology. Um, they just they just called for fine tuning. Um, so I, I now want to explain how how I came to think that the the problems with the distinction were were deeper than that and were not simply a matter of as it were clarifying its uh, definition so when i started work on metaphilosophy i, I became interested <coughs> in the relation between thought experiments and real life uh, cases that's partly for reasons that i explained when i was was talking about the uh, the philosophy of uh, philosophy um, and so, so let, let's just illustrate that. Um, this is an example that comes uh, from Bertrand uh, Russell, um, which is, it's a sort of Gettier case before Gettier. Um, in fact, he didn't use it against the justified true belief analysis of knowledge. He, he, was, he used it for kind of simpler reasons, but, but you could use it for that purpose, and people quite often have since then. So it, it's, a much, it's a much simpler kind of example um, than, than Gettier's own cases, in fact. So it, it's simply that a clock has stopped at three o'clock. And uh, someone who doesn't r realize that the clock has stopped um, you know, they they may set their watch by the clock and and just form the belief that it is three o'clock. And this guy's uh, belief uh, is justified because he, you know, it, it's a clock which let's say which normally works, or it's you know a clock in a public place where, where you'd expect the clock to be working. And um, and and so so his he has a justified belief, and um, and by. Um, just by coincidence, by chance, he happens to look at the clock at exactly three o'clock. So uh, his belief is true. So he has a justified true belief that the time is three o'clock. Um, but the standard verdict is the man does not know that it is three o'clock. Uh, this is not a case of uh, of knowledge. But it's just chance that the the clock was showing the right time. Um, and, and he's not sensitive to that uh, fact. So, so this judgment that if a man were in Russell's uh, scenario, the one I just described, he would not know that the time is three o'clock, is that's often thought to be a priori, priori, because all you need to do is to think about this hypothetical 
uh, scenario. So it seems like you don't need to go out and do any investigation to to work out um, that that this isn't a case of of knowledge. You can you can just work that out by thinking. So that as we it looks like a standard example of a priori uh, knowledge, uh, the, the, this uh, this knowledge of this conditional, that which is the kind of the verdict on the um, the thought experiment from the outside. Uh, um, of but of course, uh, you know, w w one thing that interested me is just the fact that we could also encounter Russell's scenario in real life, because I mean. It, it, the reason I was interested in this is because um, the experimental philosophers were making a lot of the fact that these were some thought experiments and they were just doing things in the imagination and um, and so on and and making it that all seem much weirder and more unusual than it really was. And so what I wanted I, to do in thinking about these or oh, using these uh, real life cases um, was to emphasize that the fact that it's, a, as it were, a fictional case rather than a real life case is not really important in the use that we make of it. And so, you know, one shouldn't um, make a big deal about the fact that these are thought experiments rather than cases that we happen to encounter in real life. They would, a real life case would, would serve the same purpose. Um, so, the the verdict um the man does not know that it is three o'clock is um a posteriori in the real life case i mean we could actually um ob you know observe this man setting his watch by the stopped clock so we would know that the, the clock has stopped but he wouldn't and and then just in an ordinary way we we can we could make the judgment look that guy doesn't know that it's three o'clock because look what he's done he's he's setting he's setting his watch by by that clock which has stopped so he, he doesn't realize there's a problem um now i think it, it's kind of fairly plausible that there is a close connection between the way we're making the judgment in the real life case and the way that we make it uh, in the the case where it's a thought experiment, because w what we do in the thought experiment is just the offline analog of what we do online in the real life case. Um, so, in the in the thought experiment case, we imaginatively suppose Russell's scenario and reach the verdict under that supposition, and from there. Um, we can reach the a priori judgment. If a man were in Russell's scenario, he would not know that the time is three o'clock by the usual suppositional procedure for judging conditionals. That was the, the, the kind of basic primary way of judging conditionals that I was talking about uh, um, in relation to my book on, uh, on conditionals. Um, but it, I mean, we don't need to go into the details of that here, but that, but that is just the normal way in which we, we come to um, make uh, judgments of uh, conditionals. And, and so what we've been doing is instead of, as we were, observing Russell's scenario, as we would in real life, actually watching the man, we're simply supposing the, the same uh, scenario. Um, and, and so the a priori, I mean, the judgment, the judgment that's at least usually classified as a priori, is made on the basis just of an offline analog of the a posteriori judgment. So, as it were, in effect, the, the same kind of capacity is being used in both cases, but in one case offline, in one case online. The same cognitive method for recognizing whether someone knows something is used online or offline. So th that's why the cases are so close and and why it, it doesn't seem to be uh, very important wh whether we use an on an online or an offline case, uh, a, a real life case or a thought experiment that, that they do, they'll do pretty much equally well. So, so, you know, it's a, it's a mistake in thinking about philosophical methodology to think that the fact that they're thought experiments is is terribly uh, important. It isn't really. Um, 
So th this kind of connection b between um, the a priori judgment made on on the basis of an offline analog of the a posteriori judgment. That, I mean, that's that's um, something much more general. I mean, and the point is that we we we're using something like recognitional capacities, um, online or offline capacities to recognize um, whether uh, some some given phenomenon uh, is, is present or or not. So just an, another I I example that would be very similar is if you think of a chess grandmaster um, who will have some kind of recognitional capacity for a winning uh, position, um, the chess grandmaster will be able to, 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 to tell whether a given position is a winning position or not, at least you know, when you're not too many moves away from the... Um, from checkmate, um, so so he could. I mean, or he or she can uh, apply um, this recognitional capacities online w by actually looking at the board and seeing the pieces. But you know, it, if um, if you just told them about this position and gave and gave them an adequate information about it, they they might might well be able to imagine it. Um, you know, if they were doing a, doing a chess problem or something like that, imagine it, uh, the board with the pieces on it that way and still recognize in their imagination that it was um, a winning position. And of course, that's what um, the, the chess grandmaster may be doing when they're think, looking at the board, but thinking several moves ahead. So they're imagining a different position on the board from the one that they can actually see, but they're still able to recognize a winning position you know, um, in that imaginary uh, situation, um, and and so it, another example would be um, going back to the the case of color uh, relations that I was talking about earlier, where um, we have some kind of recognitional capacity for which colors are more similar, um, as it were. Comparisons of similarity. So, uh, is red more similar to orange or to yellow? And we can apply that in visual uh, perception uh, online when we're actually looking at the uh, at some uh, coloured objects, or we can apply it uh, in visual imagination, which is offline. But it's the same basic capacity for making similarity judgments that we're using in both cases. And so we've got the same cognitive method for recognizing whether someone knows something is something. Um, that's the case where we're making these epistemological judgments is used online or offline. And th these kind of online, offline cognitive methods, um, they're typically calibrated online by... Uh, learning from perceptual experience. So we make judgments and then we may have to correct them or maybe, you know, for children, an adult corrects them. And so, um, and, and so it's important that the adult can actually see what the child is looking at. So oh, that would all be happening online and, the, and the, the, the child would gradually be acquiring a more accurate uh, recognitional capacity with these online cases, typically. Um, which they can then apply um, offline as well. But the, the calibration, the, the making it more, more accurate, tuning it into the, the distinction that you want, that is typically, not always, but typically uh, done um, online in, in involving real perception and so real sensory experience. Um, and, and then, as I say, that... Uh, experientially calibrated method it is then applied offline too um, and of course often when that something like that happens you actually forget the early experiences on which the method was calibrated while continuing to use the method so for example um, I think probably most people they they can't remember the the early experiences that they had when maybe they were applying the word cat to dogs or something like that and and then they were corrected by adults and gradually learned to have an accurate 
uh, recognitional capacity for uh, for cats and a different one for dogs and, <laughs> and so on. So we often, so we don't really typically. I mean, sometimes we may, may do, but but very often we don't remember the experiences on which the calibration was based. So we've, as it were, we've just got a recognitional capacity that has been calibrated in the past on, on experience, but we don't have those experiences accessible to us. They, they're forgotten. So we can't use them as evidence. We just have the, 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 the recognitional capacity itself. Um, and, and so in cases like, like this, the past experience seems to be neither strictly evidential nor purely enabling. I mean, it, it's not simply a experience that you need to, um, to understand the words, because often you can understand the words like, for example, like red and orange and yellow before you're able to 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 make these more accurate uh, judgments. So it, so it's not simply for grasping the the meanings of the words. It's actually for for just being able to apply them in a more accurate manner than than before. And so that's that's more than the just the standard enabling cases. I mean, it's it's kind of in some way feeding into um, the your evidential situation in some way, but 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 not very strictly because you you the, that past experience is not available to you. It's not I mean, since you don't know it anymore. It's not part of your evidence anymore. Um, and so those were the cases that I was interested in in the philosophy of philosophy, and I argued that the a priori a posteriori distinction is quite uh, unhelpful. <laughs> in um, understanding uh, what's going on in cases like, uh, like that. Um, it's also worth mentioning an, another line of argument that I used in the philosophy of philosophy, because it's, it's quite significant for the category of a priori uh, knowledge. Um, so th this this line of argument, it actually goes back to a symposium on the epistemology of logical reasoning at a conference in, in 2003, where I was responding to, to Paul uh, Bigossian. Uh, so this, in fact, was the, the first exchange that I ever had with, with, with Bigossian of, of an extended kind. So it was, it was really the, the origin of, uh, of the, the book, the philosophy, uh, uh, sorry, of debating the a priori. Um, although some, some of some of the ideas in it also went into the philosophy of philosophy, so Bigosian was arguing that our justification for, for basic steps of logical inference comes from uh, conditions on understanding lo logical words. That the, the, I mean, these are steps of logical inference which um, are basic in the sense that you that you're, you're not making them because you're deriving them from any other logical steps you you're just making them but and so <coughs> there's a question about how how these you're justified in these basic steps and and he was arguing that you you need to look at what what is necessary for understanding the logical words that are involved in these steps so uh for, and so for example he was interested in the case of uh modus ponens and and so, which is the move, you know, from if A then C and and A to uh, the conclusion C, and he said, and he, if you don't accept steps of modus ponens, that then um, then you don't uh, understand uh, if, and so um, he was using that to explain why we're justified in in um, making steps of modus ponens. His explanation is that there are some for some complicated reasons his explanation needed to involve um, some extra complexities that I'm not going to talk about uh, today. But, but at the heart of it was this idea that accepting modus ponens is a necessary condition for understanding if. Um, so, uh, and in his terminology, for, uh, for him, modus ponens is epistemologically analytic. That, as it were, accepting it as a precondition for understanding uh, the relevant logical word, if. <laughs>
And, and so th these kind of what we might call conceptual uh, connections, um, if, if this sort of a kind of them is right, it, it, w they would be an important source of a priori justification and knowledge, uh, both in logic and more generally in uh, philosophy. So, um, so I was interested um, in in these kind of connections uh, or supposed connections in the, writing the philosophy of philosophy because um, people who think that philosophy is um, concerned with um, understanding conceptual connections um, that the philosophical questions are basically conceptual questions um, they might well think that this and this kind of epistemological analyticity um, is uh, crucial to uh, to philosophical uh, knowledge. Um, but basically, I don't think that there is such a thing as uh, epistemological analyticity. And so in my response to Bogosian, I, I argued that there are no such links between understanding and uh, acceptance. And, and so there will be no examples of the epistemological, um, of the epistemologically analytic. Um, and uh, the, the, the main type of argument I used was thinking about a native speaker of English or whatever language we happen to be concerned with, who, um, who could can re reject some instances of modus ponens uh, because they've done, so, let's say, some some mistaken theorizing about um, conditionals, um, and um, they still understand the word if by by normal uh, linguistic uh, standards. Uh, they um, they don't they don't lose their understanding. Um, even when they reject some in instances of modus ponens, and um, I mean, there are there are various um, examples of that. There's a, a logician at MIT, Van McGee, who um, who rejects some instances of modus ponens, um, but he's he's a completely normal native speaker of English, and it would be be crazy to accuse him of uh, of not understanding the word if, and there are other people as well who've um for theoretical reasons have rejected um modus ponens no i mean they don't reject all instances of it but but they but they reject some and so don't regard it as a valid rule in general um and um i mean again there are all sorts of ins and outs of the dialectic between bogosian and me on these type of examples but this this is basically um what i'm uh, what I'm saying uh, about them. Um, and uh, that kind of counterexample can be generalized to any alleged conceptual uh, con connection. Um, that, you know, for anything that you say is a conceptual connection, you can imagine somebody who's a native speaker of the relevant language and who then, uh, and who un understands by any, you know, ordinary um, standard, but then they, they get involved in some kind of um, theoretical line of thought, um, maybe a mistaken one, but they still get involved in it, which leads them to think that this, um, this kind of conceptual connection is actually um, mistaken, um, and, and they reject it. But, but enough of the, the normal practice of using the word will still survive that that they still count as uh, understanding. Um, so that I, I think that, that that this idea of the epistemologic idea of the epistemologically analytic uh, is based on a, a misunderstanding of, of the nature of uh, ordinary linguistic understanding, which which doesn't really require any special, um, as it were, orthodoxy in theory or in, in uh, exactly how you uh, infer. It, it involves something much looser and uh, less formal than that. Um, yes, yeah, so as I say, there is nothing like Bogosian's epistemological analyticity.
and and that eliminates um, a a significant uh, potential source of a priori uh, justification and uh, and knowledge. So so th that that exchange between us so that was published in the proceedings of the Aristotelian Society for two, for two thousand and and three. So that that was that was as it were a, a early um step towards uh, the philosophy of philosophy it's the, the exchange is not itself about the a priori a posteriori um distinction but it does concern one of the sources uh of the of, of the a priori that somebody might try to uh invoke um and and so that exchange it then initiated a long series of further exchanges between us on related issues, I mean, um, which eventually turned into the book debating the A priori, which came out last year. Um, and w w one thing that happened actually in the course of that exchange, um, which as it were, it, although it started as being one about analyticity, and then, and then it moved on to the A priori, but it gradually morphed into a debate um, between internalism and externalism in epistemology um, with Bigossian um, on the internalist side and me on the externalist uh, side um, with where internalism ha and externalism they disagree about um, how far what matters in epistemology um, is stuff that's uh, accessible from the perspective of the agent's own uh, consciousness, something like that. Um, so, as it were, access internalism and access externalism. And and I'll I'll explain later how this kind of morphing uh, happened. Um, but as I say, that's that's further down the road. Um, but. One thing was that after publishing the philosophy of philosophy, um, I came to feel that it, it, its critique of the a priori, a posteriori distinction was underdeveloped and needed to be explained more fully. I didn't think it was wrong, but I, I didn't think it quite went to the the heart of the of the matter. Um, and in particular, what worried me was that it could sound as though my point was only that the distinction between the a priori and the a posteriori had some borderline cases, cases that were hard to, um, to classify um, as uh, on one side or the other. The, the, these cases, um, like the, um, uh, one of the ones I was talking about earlier, where where the, the role of experience, which has calibrated the recognitional capacity, um, but then been forgotten, um, where it seems m more than merely um, enabling, but but not strictly evidential. And so that could, you could think, oh, well, that's just a borderline case of the distinction. And, and most useful distinctions have borderline cases. So that would not really be a very strong or effective uh, Criticism. So, I mean, if you if you if you draw a line, as it were, through the space of possibilities, um, there will almost always be some cases which are are hard to classify on one side of the line or on the other. And uh, and so, if you know, if you thought that borderline cases were enough to make a distinction, no good. You you you'd be left with almost no uh, good distinctions. Um, so it, it seemed to me that the that the approach that I'd taken really gave me the basis for making a stronger criticism that that the a priori a posteriori distinction um, is superficial. It's just on the surface. But but the question was how to explain that, how to kind of nail down the um, the accusation of superficiality. What type of argument is is needed? To, to show that a distinction is superficial. And I, I think, I mean, this is not, this is a, 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 not an analogy I used at the time, but it, but it, but it, I, I used 
similar cases, uh, but this, I think this is a very a kind of easy way to understand the point. So, I mean, here's a genuine distinction. There's a genuine distinction between red bicycles and non-red bicycles. Um, some bicycles are red, some are not red. So it's a, you know, there's a real distinction we can, um, which we can apply uh, in practice. Um, but the di distinction is uh, superficial. I mean, it, it's actually both literally and metaphorically superficial, but it's literally superficial because it just has to do with the surface of the, the, the bicycle. But it's also clear that, for example, if you were giving an account of how bicycles work and why they're useful and things like that, as were a, a kind of mini theory of bicycles, um, it, there would be no need to make the distinction between um, red bicycles and non-red bicycles. I mean, that part makes no no difference. Um, and of course, one one way that you can bring out how superficial the difference is that if you take a red bicycle and you um, and you paint it green, it it stops being a red bicycle. But in all other respects, um, it, it's the same. You you've changed nothing important about the bicycle um, by by painting it a different color. And so, one thing to understand is that the point here is not that some bicycles are on the borderline between red and not red. I mean, that's true that, that there are some bicycles that are on the borderline between red and not red, but they're not important for making the point that the distinction is superficial. Um, because the, the point is that if you took a bicycle that was really clearly red, as clearly red as you like, um, and then you took the same bicycle after it has been painted to be clearly green and so clearly not red, that the change is quite superficial and unimportant. Um, and that's what seems to give much better evidence that we're dealing with a superficial uh, distinction. It, it, it's not the borderline cases. It's that it's the similarity between the cases that are clearly on one side of the line and the cases that are clearly on the other side of the line. And that's what, what you get when you, you paint your bright red bicycle uh, bright green instead. Um, and, and so, of course, then the challenge uh, is, to, is to give you know, some similar kind of argument uh, for the a priori, a posteriori distinction. Um, and, oh, and by the way, you know, I, I mean, the, the case of the, the bicycle case is, is so kind of silly that um, you, you, you might think it wasn't very important. But actually, you know, if we were talking about um, a, some botanical theory of flowers um, you know, that just classified them by their color, um, that, that would be an extremely superficial taxonomy of flowers and um you know you'd have to have to be at a very primitive stage of evolution or of acquaintance with flowers to think that that the thing that was most important about them was simply their color if, if you were interested in them for not not simply as decorations or something um and if you if you wanted to understand something more about the nature of these flowers, how they grew, what they could be used for, those kinds of things. The, the, the color distinctions would not be the, uh, the important ones. Um, so, as I say, the, the, the question is whether one can make um, an analogous uh, argument by showing a clear case of a priori knowledge to be deeply similar to a corresponding clear case of a posteriori knowledge. So that would be like the similarity between the clearly red bicycle and the clearly green bicycle. Um, so I was invited to contribute to a collection of essays on the a priori in philosophy, which, which actually came out um, in 2013, edited by uh, Albert Casulo and, and Joshua Thoreau. I, so I 
I use that invitation as an opportunity to to develop the argument um, for the uh, superficiality of the a priori, a posteriori distinction. And I, again, I, I took the, um, the example of, of knowledge of color relations uh, as a, an example of the a priori, because it's quite often used that way um, by, by friends of the a priori, by, by philosophers who, um, who like the category of the a priori. And they, when they want to explain what's a priori, you, I mean, you find that they often give you examples of color relations. But, um, and, and so I thought that would be you know, a good case to use um, because um, it, it's one where at least um, it, generally it, it's regarded as a clear case of the a priori, not as a controversial case. And so I, as I say, I, I used that one. And, uh, and I, I, in particular, I took as my uh, paradigm um, normal knowledge of um, of one that all crimson things uh, are red, and it, it's important for the uh, example that um, that we're talking about um, someone who's who's learned the words red and crimson independently. So they haven't been taught the word crimson by just being explained that. Um, that it's a kind of uh, red or something like that. It's they've simply um, learned the word crimson by being shown uh, examples of crimson and examples of things that are not crimson, and um, and then they've they've learned the word crimson. You can learn the word crimson perfectly well uh, like that, um, and uh, and then they, they come to. Um, and then they've also learned the word red independently of the way they learn crimson, again, by being shown examples of things that are red and examples of things that are not red. And then and then they, they, they're asked about this relation between them, all crimson things that are red. You can, to make the same point, you can also consider cases um, where, where, where people uh, learn, for example, uh, words from different languages and uh, um and then compare them but but i think in this case will be will be fine uh, for the for the present um so so it seems that, that just somebody who who independently understands the words crimson and red that they, they can come to know that all crimson things are red um and and then I wanted a, a similar uh, example to complete the argument, um, as a, which would be a clear case of a posteriori knowledge. And so I, I considered um, a, a series of traditionally read books. I, I'm, I'm just going to call them WW books. They're, they're actually, uh, the, the example I gave used a, a series of um, it, it, Called Who's Who, um, which, which gives sort of biographies of well-known people, but it, but it, that that part doesn't matter. It's just it's just a series of books where it, they they uh, traditionally they're all in red, um, and so I took knowledge of, of sentence two that all WW books are read, um, and again by someone who has a general recognitional capacity for WW books, they they can recognise one one when they see it. But but where they don't remember any particular one, so they're not drawing on you know some kind of um, memory image of some particular um, WW book. They they could just they just look at those books and and they recognise what they uh, are. And um, and so we've got uh, two sentences which are uh, one one and two which are um, very similar in structure. Um, but where the first of them um, is an example of a priori knowledge and the second an example of a posteriori um, knowledge. Um, uh, but of course, we, we need to um, think about whether the, the similarity extends to the way in which these two 
um, as it was semantically similar uh, sentences in some ways uh, um, uh, are known. Um, so one can come to know um, number one um, by by using one's recognitional capacities for for crimson and for red offline to uh, imagine a crimson thing and judge its red. So you 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 ask yourself the question already understanding crimson the words crimson and red you, but not having a, related them to each other yet maybe you've never thought of them in the same context um and and so so you just ask the question well are all crimson things red and you Im imagine a crimson thing and um you judge that it's uh red um what's going on has to be a bit more complicated than than that for for various reasons but but that's um what that's as it were at least a rough description of what's going um on i mean you you also have to have some sense of um how how wide the, the boundaries are and, and so on but but that these are all also things that, that that just come from the recognitional uh capacity and so it seems that you know if you understand these color terms just by because you can you have the right recognitional capacities for them you can do you can actually come to know one simply by this kind of imaginative exercise um which i've given in a slightly simplified form here but but it, it seems you don't actually need to go and look at some crimson things to know that all crimson things are red if, if you've got a good recognitional capacity for crimson um and in fact, you could come to know too by also by using one your recognitional capacity for for WW book and red offline um, to imagine. Oh, sorry, I've, it says a crimson thing, but it should say to imagine a WW book um, and judge uh, it's red. So you imagine a WW book, and you in the same sort of way you uh, you judge it, it's red. And uh, again, there are some there are some kind of complications but it but basically you, you can do it just by this imaginative exercise um and so of course as well just to emphasize what i've been saying in in both cases the the result constitutes knowledge only if various background conditions are met but you know I, those background conditions often are met and I think, I mean, the, one thing that's important here is that the the kind of imaginative exercise that you go through to um, to come to know sentence one um, a priori just it is the kind of I, I mean that, that that's when people talk about it being a, a priori, it's that imaginative exercise that it is as it were, motivating them to call it a priori, because that's the one that you just go through, um, you know, in your head without actually needing to look at, at any real life uh, examples. Um, and so, so this is, it's, to me, it's, it's actually fair to the defenders of the a priori, because, because the kind of process that I'm describing just is what you have to, uh, to do. And it's not clear how you, if you've learned the terms independently from each other, how else you'd come to to know them? Um, so the resulting knowledge of one and two um, is basically is it's deeply similar, even though the knowledge of one, I'm, I'm allowing, I'm not challenging the judgment that, what, that one is known uh, a priori, and, um, and I'm not challenging the judgment that two is known a posteriori. Um, that, that those would just be the standard judgments, and I'm, I'm just accepting those. I'm accepting that that's, that's the way that people um, apply the distinction here. I'm not... I'm not um, and... Um, and so I'm saying, as it were, given that those 
uh, standard applications are correct, then, you know, and here's an example of clearly a priori knowledge of one, clearly a posteriori knowledge of two, um, both of which are, um, uh, which are deeply similar to each other. And that's, that's the analog of the, as were well, the red bicycle and the green bicycle, which are basically uh, uh, apart from the trivial matter of what color they are, are basically the, um, work in exactly the same way and have the, all the other properties the same. Um, so Bregosian and, and I, we, we had another exchange at, at a conference on the a priori in 2013, where he presented a paper criticizing the kind of argument that I've just given. Uh, um, I mean, of course, in the, in the paper, it, it's presented um, with much more detail. And, and then I replied uh, to his criticism at that conference. And, um, and Bogosian's uh, objection was that, that the ag argument that I was using, it assumed epistemological externalism uh, because my background conditions for knowledge concerned reliability and um, and then he was, uh, Gossi was objecting that they're insufficient for knowledge. I mean, he was arguing that this process that I was describing by itself could not provide knowledge that all crimson things uh, are are read or that, that all WW uh, books are read. Um, and my reply was, I, that I wasn't assuming externalism. Um, because um, I was taking it that uh, everyone, you know, except for some skeptics, um, agrees that we can know, uh, one, um, that all crimson things are red. Um, and, you know, of course, for friends of the a priori, that's the, that knowledge is actually a paradigm of, of a priori knowledge. And, um, and there's no other plausible mechanism for knowing one available that would that would be a priori in that way. It seems like the the, the kind of um, imaginative exercise that I'm describing, it just is how we would come to know it uh, a priori, given that we that we can know it uh, a priori. That it has to be by something like the kind of process that I described. Um, and and then the the case of two is is analogous, but just a, a posteriori. And um, and I argue that if you try to add further conditions for internalist justification, that they would just lead to some kind of regress and 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 eventually just to to skepticism that you would not be able um, to to come to know um, one in this way um, if you required more um, than I'd. Uh, a given, um, and uh, and so you know, it, it wasn't that my argument had an externalist um, premise. It it was just that well, look, if we know this a priori at, at all in the kind of circumstances I'm describing, um, this is how we know it, and so this this process um, must. Um, by hypothesis, um, constitute um, knowledge, and uh, and then the, uh, various conditions have to be met. Because if these conditions were not met, um, the the process would be too unreliable to be to be knowledge. And but I'm but I'm as we're taking it, what the premise is really just that that one you know one can come to know um, that that all crimson things are read through this kind of imaginative process, because I mean, that's, that's what the friends of the a priori um, seem to, uh, to have um, in mind. Um, and I mean, I notice by the way that, that the kind of appealing to that sort of imaginative process that is not in itself hostile to internalism, because the imaginative process that I'm describing is one that, is, that 
it is accessible to consciousness, at least the, the um, as it were, the basic comparison. I was allowing that that was a conscious uh, comparison. So in that respect, I wasn't making it a, a sort of merely externalist uh, process. But, um, but of course, it, I think as we're both sides would agree that if, if you went through that process, if, if, the, if there was, you know, in cases where you, the, um, you're, you were doing this in a very reliable um, and unreliable way, that, that, um, that that could might, might not constitute um, knowledge, um, but the and so the as were the, the case may in the end be part be used as an argument for externalism um, because this is a case which was agreed to constitute knowledge, but where the the requirements for it to be knowledge do not all seem to meet the um the internalist um conditions of, of, of accessibility but it is but it's not it's not assuming knowledge it, it's like it's not assuming externalism it, it would actually be an argument for uh externalism um because it's very hard to see how the the internalists can give a plausible account of how all of this could give you knowledge at all, and so the, they would have to. I mean, the alternative would be for the internalists to become a skeptic about these kind of cases. But um, but if that generalizes, that then the, uh, internalism would be leading to skepticism, which is not what most internalists want. Um. So, so that was really the point at which the debate between Bogosian and me became, as it were, explicitly entangled with the debate between internalism and externalism. Um, so, you, I mean, you might think maybe there were aspects of it which were already implicitly like that before, but 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 that that was how um, internalism and externalism really became. Um, came onto the stage um, in, in our exchanges. Um, so, just to, as a way to fill you in on the, the as a whether how things in fact happened by so by that stage the exchanges between Abigosin and me had been continuing for ten years, and so friends suggested that they would make an interesting book because of the contrast between our. Uh, positions and the way that these debates were all connected with each other. So, so we approached Oxford University Press, which agreed to publish a volume of the exchanges so far with some extra essays and new exchanges added. And, and that's, uh, that became the, the book debating the a priori. Um, so one new turn in the debate um, was, was a to some extent, a change in Bogosian's position. Um, so back at the time of the original exchange in 2003, um, he'd initially treated appeal to intuitions as just too obscure to be helpful. It just was too unclear what intuitions were. Um, but he gradually became convinced that something like intuitions were, were needed um in to explain what's going on in some cases and um and so he started using uh intuitions to provide a priori internalist justification in some some cases he didn't completely give up the connection with understanding but he, but there were cases particularly cases about moral judgments um that he wanted to explain using intuitions um yeah so so he he takes um, intuitions of moral principles to be needed to justify um, moral uh, beliefs. Because um, after all, um, the an appeal to connections between understanding and assent to certain basic principles um, doesn't seem so plausible in the moral case. I mean, the, the, it's harder to, to 
to give cases where um you know of substantive moral principles where you could you, you could say that um well if you don't un- if you don't accept this principle then you don't understand what the words mean i mean so for example you know if if um you know if you take a principle like it it's um it's morally wrong to to torture children or something um you know somebody who 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 disputes that they might just dispute it because they've got some very alternative morality i mean one that we would maybe think is completely mistaken but 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 it, we, we wouldn't say that that they didn't know what the word wrong meant normally it was just that they had very very uh, you know extreme views about it that went contrary to uh, to what most people thought and so on but but it wouldn't be a i mean it would be very hard to, to treat that as a case of failure of uh ling- purely linguistic understanding uh, it seems like as it were, in the case of morality, we're more willing than in the case, well, more willing than internalists are in the case of, of logical principles to, to think that these are things that um, can be disagreed about. Um, so, of course, Bogosian, since he'd originally been very sceptical about um, intuitions because he thought it wasn't, it wasn't clear what they are, he he needs to say something about what intuitions are, and so he takes them to be intellectual seemings uh, which present a proposition as true, um, or he even present it as necessary. Um, so it might be that they that you have an an intellectual seeming that a certain moral principle um, is true, and a really important aspect of Bogosian's uh, position is that these intellectual s- seemings are pre-doxastic, which means that they're prior to belief, and they're even prior to a disposition to believe anything. Um, because um, if, because he wants to use the intellectual seemings to justify um, the the belief in the same way uh, as ref- I mean, the analogy would be with people who use perceptual seemings to justify perceptual beliefs and and the thing is if these intellectual seemings were really just something like uh, you know uh, that they involved that you know either that you were, were already judging um, the the principle to be true, or maybe that you were kind of you you're feeling the the, the pull, the disposition to uh, to judge that it's true, then th- that would be too close to a circular justification for um, for Bogosian to be um, satisfied uh, with it, because it, it seems like it would be in effect. The, the the belief justifying itself, or at least your disposition to have this belief justifying um, having the, the belief. And that, that seems like a circular justification. So um, so they need to, these intellectual seemings or intuitions, that they they need to be pre-doxastic to, um, to do the, the epistemological work that Bogosian wants them to do. Um, so, to my uh, reply in these exchanges is that there's no evidence that we have such predoxastic intellectual seemings. Um, we we make some judgments without conscious uh, reflection, and in cases of uncertainty, we sometimes feel inclined to make a judgment uh, before having made it. But that none of that is predoxastic. I just don't see any evidence whatsoever that we have. Um, these intellectual seemings, which are which are prior to any inclination to believe. So I think that, as it were, the, the, the pre-doxastic um, intellectual seemings are basically um, a myth that there are no intuitions um, in Bogosian sense. Uh, I mean, or maybe maybe there are some kind of there are some very strange psychological states in which you've got something like. Um, 
the kind of thing that Pugosin is talking about, but but that they are, are not a, at all a normal uh, part of our, our thinking when we, for example, when we get um, knowledge or justified belief in, in a moral uh, principle. Um, and, and one consideration in, in that direction is, is that, that Bogosian's approach is actually quite implausible from an evolutionary perspective. It's just implausible that that's the way our minds would work because um, th these in pre-doxastic intellectual seemings, they're, they're meant to be accessible to consciousness. I mean, they, um, but I mean, they're, 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 as were they're there in our consciousness. But um, conscious processes tend to be much slower than unconscious ones. And they take up um, valuable resources of short-term memory. Um, and, and as I say, it's, it's actually Bogosian's internalism that requires these intuitions to be conscious. We, it, it, things have actually got to seem to us that way, and that's a, that's a kind of process in our consciousness. And th so that would mean that, that whenever we had um, this kind of uh, justification, we'd be cluttering up consciousness with pre-doxastic intuitions whose only role would be to provide internalist justification. And, and that would be really slow and costly. I mean, to put it crudely, um, in evolutionary terms, such creatures would tend to be eaten by predators before they could decide what to do. Um, so, as it were, it, be, because conscious processing is so um, slow and costly in terms of cognitive resources, as much as possible has to be done uh, unconsciously. Um, and, you know, it's only the as were ones which are difficult to resolve um, conscious, uh, unconsciously that as we have to come to the level of consciousness for a decision. Um, and, and so, you know, on evolutionary grounds, I think you would not expect um, that human beings would have um, the kind of, uh, intellectual seemings, at least uh, you know, in any normal case uh, that of a pre-doxastic sort that Bogosian is uh, describing. Um, so, uh, uh, just to uh, you know, in the, in the final um, few minutes of the lecture, I want to talk about a more general problem for internalist justification, um, which is that it demands only the internal coherence of the agent's uh, beliefs and intuitions. Um, and as I say, uh, this is still all relevant to the a priori, a posteriori um, distinction. Um, that because it, uh, this, it's, this is the kind of justification that, that a pro for the internalist, like Bogosian, um, justification would have to be. So it, it's... Um, you can't ask for more of, of, you know, of a belief than that it coheres with, with the other things which are uh, past the internalist standard of accessibility. So that will be maybe other beliefs and, um, and maybe the agent's intuitions and intellectual seemings. But that's, that kind of inter internal coherence is all that, that from an internalist point of view you can really uh, expect. And um, and so, you know, if we take, let's say, a consistent um, Nazi, um, consistent supporter of Hitler, um, and so th this is one whose beliefs and intuitions, they all cohere together. Um, they'll be justified, uh, he'll be justified in his beliefs by internalist um, standards. Um, and, um, and I should say that you know, at least in principle, it seems that a consistent Nazi is possible. I mean, of course, it's not that easy to be for any of us to be completely consistent in our beliefs. Um, but but it, you know, it, it may be possible in principle, and and it, and it it doesn't seem. I mean, there isn't some kind of 
logical inconsistency in basic Nazi beliefs, which would, would mean that you just it's just impossible to be a consistent Nazi. It may it may be difficult, but it, it, it's also difficult to be you know a consistent supporter of some different and better uh, uh, view than than Nazism. Um, so so it's the, you can't. I don't think it's plausible to say that 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 a consistent Nazi is impossible. Um, but he's, but then the consistent Nazi is going to be justified by the internalist standards. And and so just you know to to, to give an example, suppose that the, uh, a Nazi believes uh, um, that that he ought to kill uh, non Aryan children. His belief will be justified by internalist uh, standards. Um, and of course, that doesn't mean that the internalist is saying that his belief is true, because um, I mean, Bukowski is very clear about this, that, and, and so are other internalists. That internalist justification does not require truth. There can be internalist justification for a false uh, belief. Um, but so the problem is not that um, that in saying that the belief is justified, that the that the internists would be saying that it's true. They're not saying that, but but it seems that just saying that even that, that a belief that he he ought to kill non-Aryan children that's a justified belief it, by by normal standards. That's that is a, a very problematic thing to. Uh, to say, um, and and perhaps we can, as it were, make, I mean, reinforce the point by by considering that the function of beliefs is to be acted on. I mean, that's in a way why we have beliefs so that we can act on them. But um, and the difference between believing something and just imagining it is basically a difference in their connections with action. So by internalist standards, then I mean, the question arises, if the Nazi is justified in believing that uh, he ought to kill non-Aryan children, is he also justified in acting on his belief and killing the children? Because that's what, uh, I mean, the belief does involve a disposition to act uh, on it. Um, and, I mean, the idea that this Nazi would be justified in killing the children seems to have lost touch with any reasonable standard of justification, um, and of course, you know, it, it wouldn't really help the internalist to use the term justified in some special technical sense because um, that wouldn't explain how it addresses the epistemological and normative questions that we are uh, interested in. And um, and internalists, um, they typically think that, as it were, justification is kind of central issue um, in. Uh, in epistemology, it's not just some marginal thing, and and I think it's also the case that that what they what they say about the reasons for being internalist about justification if, um, seem to extend to the justification of action as well as to the justification uh, of belief. So um, that it seems to me that this this is a big problem for internalism about. Um, about justification, in, in that it, it comes out with saying that really some really horrible things can be justified, horrible beliefs, but also it seems horrible actions. Um, so, just to uh, to conclude, um, I think internalism is philosophically it's a dead end. It, it, it's it's not going anywhere interesting, um, and. Um, that we therefore we should approach the a priori a posteriori distinction in a more externalist spirit and uh, from an externalist perspective the distinction between these two modes of uh, knowledge or justification um, looks like a really superficial one I've I, I, as I've made clear I haven't been arguing that there's no distinction there at all, just as there is, a, after all, a distinction between red and non-red bicycles. Um, what I've been insisting is, it's just you can make that distinction, but it 
And it might be useful, as it were, when we're very early on, you know, in the most elementary stages of epistemology, just a kind of crude classification like that might be useful. But when, I think when we're going deeper, um, then the a priori, a posteriori distinction is no longer going to uh, help us. And so we need to make different sorts of uh, distinction um, in understanding cognition. And thank you very much. And now I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Professor Gibson Williamson, for your interesting talk. Now I give a short introduction to Professor uh, uh, Matt Luce. Uh, he is the uh, interlocutor uh, tonight. Matt Luce is a, is associate professor of philosophy at Wuhan University, where he has worked since earning his PhD from the University of Southern California in 2015. He specializes in epistemology and metaethics with a particular fo focus on moral epistemology. His work has appeared in many leading journals, including philosophical studies, acceptance, synthesis, and Oxford study in metaethics. He is the author of the Moral Literalism article for the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And he is co authoring a book, Is Morality Rare? with Spencer Keats. Copy published by Rotlich. Now, please, Professor Matt Luce, give your comments and questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's a it's a great honor for me to be uh, giving comments on uh, Professor Williamson's uh, work. I've always loved his work. Uh, I've always enjoyed seeing him present his work, uh, and so it's it's wonderful for me to be able to give comments uh, here on it today. So I will uh, share my screen. One second. Uh, hold on. Hold on. Okay. And so here are my comments on uh, Williamson's talk. Um, so uh, Professor Williamson uh, is arguing against, uh, well, he's, he's saying a, a number of things, but the, the, the main point that he's making is he's arguing against the significance of the a priori and a posteriori distinction. Uh, he admits, of course, that we can distinguish a priori propositions from a posteriori propositions uh, from the bottom up, so to speak. We can uh, give a whole bunch of different examples of um, propositions and sort them fairly reliably into the a priori or the a posteriori propositions. But it's somewhat harder to give a characterization of this distinction from the top down to give a, a general theoretical characterization of what the difference between the a priori and the a posteriori is. Uh, we might say that we know about things uh, um, a priori just by thinking about them, and we know about things a posteriori uh, by our experiences. Uh, but of course, we often know about things a posteriori by thinking about them. If there's a difficult scientific question, some amount of complicated thought is going to go into deciding uh, the correct answer there. Um, and we often know about things a priori by our experiences, either our own internal experiences of, of reasoning or external experiences, as when we need to use a, a pen and paper to work out a mathematical proof. Um, the
The central case that uh, Professor Williamson gives to, to argue against this distinction is a case of, of two propositions, uh, one which is a paradigmatic a priori proposition, and the other of which is a paradigmatic a posteriori proposition. Uh, proposition one, all crimson things are red, is the a priori proposition, and two, all recent volumes of who's who are red, is the a posteriori proposition. Now, Professor Williamson uh, gives a, a case of, a, of an agent, Norman, um, who figures out both of these things using a remarkably similar method. Uh, in both cases, uh, he imagines, uses imagination to imagine a number of crimson things. Um, and in doing so, he comes to realize that they are all red and thereby comes to believe one. Similarly, uh, Norman imagines a number of volumes of who's who. In doing so, he realizes that they are all red and comes to believe two. So uh, he concludes, uh, this is a quote from the, the book with Boghossian, uh, the problem is obvious. As characterized earlier, cognitive processes underlying Norman's clearly a priori knowledge of one and his clearly a posteriori knowledge of two are almost exactly similar. Uh, if, if so, how can there be a deep epistemological difference between them? But if there is none, then the a priori, a posteriori distinction is epistemologically shallow. So I think it's a very interesting attack to be made on the uh, a priori, a posteriori distinction. Um, uh, so it, it falls to me uh, to, to defend it, uh, to give a, a, the, the best defense that I can, uh, and thereby uh, push back against Professor Williamson a little bit and um, get him to uh, explain his thinking in a little bit more detail. Um, now, uh, as he mentioned, his uh, debate with uh, Boghossian um, turned into a debate about internalism and externalism. Uh, I will not be trying to relitigate the internalism externalism debate here. I will, however, be relitigating another uh, historically important debate, uh, which we'll get to in a second. But before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about what uh, Professor Williamson and I uh, agree on. And in particular, uh, we agree quite a bit about the uh, role of the imagination. One of the uh, central bits of uh, Professor Williamson's argument is that we can use our imagination to know things. That's what's going on in this case of Norman with the uh, all crimson things and all recent volumes of who's who. We're using our imagination to figure out um, both of those claims. Uh, so Professor Williamson says that the imagination can be a source of genuine a priori and a posteriori knowledge. Uh, and I quite agree with that. Uh, I think that is an important and often underappreciated point. Um, second, he says that the imagination can give us knowledge of facts that are outside of our immediate experience. We don't just imagine things that we've already experienced. Um, we can use imagination to extend our knowledge of the world, and I think that's true as well. Um, and he says that imagination is our main source of knowledge of counterfactuals, uh, and I agree with that as well. Um, in another essay in the book uh, with Boghossian that he didn't talk about uh, this evening, uh, he mentions that there is uh, good evolutionary reasons why our imagination should be reliable and why this can uh, is, a, is a vindication of the fact that the imagination can give us knowledge. And I agree with him about that as well. But let's not get too carried away. Um, the, there's a threat here, uh, the trap of imaginative Minoism. Uh, now, as everyone knows, uh, Plato in the Mino uh, suggested that everything that we know could be known uh, by our memory because we experience the forms and the demiurges plan for the, the world's uh, continuation before we were born. And so everything that we, we know is or could be just memory of what we had learned earlier. Um, now, of course, uh, this, uh, this view about memory and knowledge is crazy. Um, but once we're talking about uh, imagination as a source of knowledge in uh, a variety of different uh, ways with a very broad scope, then there's a trap of imaginative minoism that perhaps uh, the, everything that we know is or could be known by the imagination. Now, that is also nuts. So in saying that imagination can provide us with knowledge in a variety of ways, we also need an account of how the imagination works that gives us knowledge, which establishes limits on imaginative knowledge so we don't fall into the trap of imaginative minoism. Now, I'm not saying that Professor Williamson does fall into the trap of imaginative minoism, but it is a threat uh, for anyone who uh, thinks that the imagination is a robust source of knowledge. 
Um, so I'm going to explain how I avoid that trap. I'd be interested in hearing how uh, how he avoids that trap. I think I know what he's going to say, but he'll explain it for all of us uh, shortly. So um, how does the imagination work? So first off, uh, a concept which I think is important, this concept of an explanatory map. Uh, our beliefs represent the world, and when we take all of our beliefs together, that is a map of the world. That's a pretty popular metaphor among epistemologists, uh, but I like to have my own little twist to it. I like to talk about an explanatory map. The reason I like to talk about an explanatory map is because our beliefs don't just represent the world as being in particular ways. Uh, or we also have explanatory beliefs, beliefs about how different bits of reality are related to one another. Our map of the world doesn't just have that A happened and that B happened. It has that A happened because B happened, or in general, that A type events happen because B type events happen. And these explanatory beliefs together with particular beliefs uh, make our total map of the world, not just the map of the way the world is, but also the way the world works. It gives it structure, both physically and causally, saying what depends on what and how the world will evolve over time. And I think that all of our cognitive processes run in some way or in some degree or another on this explanatory map, which is often uh, operating subconsciously in the background. And this informs how we're able to use our imagination. So there are a number of different ways that we can use our imagination. One way we could call an extending use of the imagination. Uh, on the basis of our beliefs about the way the world is and the way the world works, we can extend our map into the future or the past in accordance with explanatory structures. If I know the way the world is right now, and I know what will tend to occur, what the current state of affairs will tend to bring about in the future, then I can figure out what's going to happen in the future. This is a standard sort of uh, explanatory, forward explanatory inference, but this is often occurring within the imagination. We think of what will happen. Our imagination is sort of the, the, um, the stage where this uh, uh, inference takes place. Uh, quite often. This is a source of genuine inferential knowledge. Uh, here's another way that we can use our imagination. Um, we can go into our explanatory map and tinker with a belief to take something that we believe to be true, but imagine what would happen if it were false. Uh, when we do that, because we're still holding the rest of the map similar, in, uh, in particular, the explanatory relations that structure that map, we can, by changing one of the particular beliefs, then sort of roll forward what would happen in accordance with the general explanatory structure of that map. And that will tell us what would happen if this one thing, which we believe to be false, were in fact true. And this is how we know about counterfactuals. This is our primary, perhaps only source of knowledge of counterfactuals. Now, this account of how the imagination works has limits built into it. Extending use of the imagination are just a normal sort of explanatory uh, inference. And so how uh, well supported uh, our conclusions will be um, as a result of extending use of the imagination depends on how well supported our current beliefs are um, about the world and its explanatory structure. Revising use of the imagination, similarly, are ways of extracting beliefs about counterfactuals from beliefs about explanatory structure. And so, similarly, conclusions that result from revising use of the imagination are only as well supported as the prior beliefs about the explanatory structure of the world. So this places good limits on uh, the um, extent of our knowledge by imagination and prevents the slide into imagining realism. Now, there is a third use of the imagination, though. Uh, in the revising use of imagination, uh, we take something that we believe to be true and imagine that it is false. But what if we have a proposition that we believe to be true, but we can't in any way imagine that it's false? Well, that it would be the feasible evidence that it can't be false, or is at least actually, um, let's just say false, is at least actually false, right? Um, sorry, if you can't imagine that it's false, then it can't be false, so it is feasibly uh, evidence that that is true. So uh, Norman knows too, right, the, uh, that all volumes of Who's Who are read by an extending use of the imagination, but he can imagine that two is false. He can imagine a recent volume of Who's Who that is blue, but he can't imagine a crimson thing that is blue, nor could he imagine a bachelor who is married, nor could he imagine 
putting two apples together and two apples together and ending up with any number of apples on his desk other than four and so on and so forth. So this, I think, uh, is how we should think about a priori knowledge. Some things are unimaginable because imagining them would mean that there's a contradiction in our concepts. Uh, if there's a contradiction in our concepts, then we know that what we are imagining can't possibly be true. So when we have knowledge in this sort of way, knowledge of things where it would be a contradiction to try to imagine them to be true, therefore we can't know about them, then we have a priori knowledge of these relations of ideas. And then a priori knowledge is, is everything else. It's knowledge of matters of fact. Uh, and our knowledge of matters of fact is uh, constrained by and grounded by uh, the evidence of our, uh, of our senses and experimental reasoning. Now, this, of course, is just Hume's doctrine that there is two kinds of knowledge, knowledge of uh, uh, relations of ideas and knowledge of matters of fact. Uh, and I think that's what the a priori, a posteriori distinction is. It just maps exactly onto Hume's distinction between matters of fact and relations of ideas. So I think that the a priori, a posteriori distinction is significant, and that's because the Humean distinction between relations of ideas and matters of fact is distinct. It's an important distinction as well. Now, there's a very obvious objection that you're going to make right now, and that objection is that I am crazy. Here I am defending humanism, right, which is quite unpopular view these days. Um, and there are lots of reasons why people don't like humanism. Now, I think a lot of the reasons why people don't like humanism is because it's tied up with a larger positivist program. And the larger positivist program is wrong. But the problems with positivism have to come with verificationism, not with humanism. That's a big topic. Not going to get into that today, but I will talk about three particular salient objections to humanism uh, to defend against those objections because they're, they're particularly relevant in the current context. So the first objection is that there must be synthetic a priori knowledge. Right? Kant said this, and, and a more contemporary way of putting this point would be to say that Hume's distinction between uh, relations of ideas and matters of fact is itself not analytic. Humanism is itself synthetic, so if we were to know that humanism is true, there must be synthetic a priori knowledge. The view is self-undermining, therefore it's false, QED. My response to this objection is that it is analytic that all a priori knowledge is analytic. It's just one of those non-obvious analytic truths. Uh, now, supporting this in uh, detail would take far too long, but I think it's interesting that uh, Professor Williamson's arguments actually somewhat indirectly support this point. Um, we can't draw a meaningful a priori, a posteriori distinction in any other way. Um, the fact that it's hard to describe what could be at issue with the a priori, a posteriori distinction without relying on humanism, I think is an indication at least that it is analytic, that all a priori knowledge is analytic. Although not obvious that this is the case. Um, a second objection uh, is uh, Kripke's objection that the a priori, a posteriori distinction is an epistemic distinction, but the analytic synthetic distinction is a conceptual or linguistic distinction, right? So these are just two different things. Now in a way, this is just the first uh, objection. Right. If the a priori a posteriori distinction is epistemic and the conceptual linguistic distinction, uh, the, sorry, the analytic synthetic distinction is conceptual, that means conceptually there is room to mix and match these things. And so we can have synthetic a priori knowledge. But again, I think that we can't have synthetic a priori knowledge. We can only have analytic a priori knowledge. Um, Kripke is wrong to say that uh, the a priori, a priori, eh, the a priori, a posteriori distinction is entirely epistemic. It is both epistemic and conceptual. And again, I think this is the key to answering Professor Williamson's challenge about uh, the depth of the a priori, a posteriori distinction. If we try to think of it as only epistemic, a merely epistemic distinction, it does end up being quite shallow. But once we realize that it is both uh, epistemic and conceptual, that provides depth and significance to the distinction. So a third objection to humanism is uh, Professor Williamson's own preferred objection, or at least it's the one that uh, he gives uh, in the book with Boghossian, and Boghossian gives it as well. The objection is this. Uh, humanism uh, is committed to uh, what Boghossian calls metaphysical analyticity. Uh, so this is analytic, uh, and the analyticity is grounded in something metaphysically real. It's grounded in relations between ideas. It's grounded in relations between concepts. Uh, 
So analytic knowledge is conceptual knowledge. Um, but the objection that Bogosian gives, in which Williamson agrees with, is that uh, when we have a priori knowledge, we often have a priori knowledge of the world, not just our concepts. So for instance, we know a priori that all squares have four sides, but that's knowledge about squares, not knowledge about the ideas of squares. So this gets the just wrong, um, uh, wrong subject matter for a priori knowledge. Um, my response to this is to say that conceptual knowledge can give us knowledge about the world, even though it is first and foremost knowledge of our concepts. Now, how could that work? Uh, I'll tell you how it'll work in a second, but let me first prove that it does. Uh, even such a great enemy as of analyticity as Klein allowed that we could have uh, analytic knowledge or synonymous expressions by arbitrary stipulation. So here's an arbitrary stipulation that I'm going to make right now. A blook. What is a blook? A blook is a blue book. That is the concept of a blook. You did not have that concept before, but I just gave it to you right now. A blook is a blue book. Blook is just, the concept of blook is just a conjunction of the concepts blue and book. So now you've just gotten mastered a new concept. Congratulations. And this allows you to draw the following conclusion. All blooks are blue. Now that's a fact about the world. It's not a fact about the concept of a blook. That's a fact about the world. It's a fact about all blooks that they are blue. So what is this magic? What is this hocus pocus? How can I give you knowledge about the world by giving you a new concept, the concept of a blook? Well, I think the answer has to do with propositions. Propositional knowledge is knowledge of propositions and propositions represent the world as being a certain way. And they represent that world as being a certain way because concepts represent particular features of the world and propositions are composed of concepts. So whether or not a proposition is true depends on how that proposition represents the world as being. Um, and some propositions cannot help but represent truly in virtue of their constituent concepts, right? Um, all bachelors are unmarried must represent truly because of the relationship between the concepts of uh, bachelor and unmarried. Just like all blooks are blue, must represent the world truly because of the relationship between the concept of blook and the blue. Right? So when there are uh, propositions that cannot help but represent the world truly in virtue of their constituent concepts, we can know by reflection on those concepts that they uh, cannot help but represent the world truly and those are the a priori knowable propositions, the ones that we can know that they're true by reflection on the constituent concepts. Um, so uh, I'm sure I'm wrong, but uh, to, to summarize, uh, if humanism is correct, then the a priori a posterior distinction can be saved, not just as a real distinction, but as a real and important distinction. Uh, and I agree with Professor Williamson that I don't think it can be saved any other way. Um, so uh, as a human and a defender of a dogma, uh, I think that uh, humanism uh, and the a priori and a posteriori distinction are correct. Professor Williamson is neither a human nor a defender of the distinction. Um, so he's gonna reason it the other way. And uh, right now he's going to tell me why humanism is wrong. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Well, th th thanks very much. Um, I mean, that's that's very interesting, and I, I mean, I'm not sure that I'll have time to respond to to everything that you you were saying. Um, but let me start out with with the the question of what we can or can't um, imagine. Um, so. I mean, I can, I can imagine being wrong about whether all crimson things are red. Um, and, um, you know, I, I could, it's not unimaginable for me that, that for example, that I've been um, mis- simply misjudging um w w one of these um terms and that 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 i've uh i've 
lost lost touch with the the actual distinctions between crimson and not crimson or um or um you know a red and a not red um i mean the way you put it which is as it were slightly more cons in slightly more kind of as one might say de ray terms is it that one can't imagine a, a crimson thing that is blue um so let's i mean first of all take the uh the case of um imagining a, a copy of who's who that's that's blue um and i mean i, th I think we probably both agree that we can Im imagine that but um as it were in order to um to uh, imagine it i i have to kind of as it were switch off my recognitional capacity for for who's who and um and treat that um as uh, you know not 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 operative here because as it were um it, that recognitional capacity is if i imagine a a, a blue um a blue book it's telling me it's not a, a copy of who's who but but um we, i can uh, imagine that that's uh that that's wrong um and and i but i can do the same thing with um you know if i can imagine um a sh a shade of uh, uh of reddish blue or something like that and then i can switch off my um recognitional capacity for um to crimson which is uh, which is telling me that that um it's uh that, that that's not uh that's not crimson and and so i do, i don't i don't think that these are um that any of these things are are utterly uh unimaginable um i do think that something that is complicating the issue um is that there's a there's a genuine modal distinction between the two examples because it because in fact of course all crimson things are red and and it's even necessary that all crimson things are red whereas it's certainly contingent that all copies of uh, who's who are are red and and so if I think it's very easy in these cases to start switching to um, to um, to modal contents where where we're talking about um you know wh wh how how we um wh what we now think about uh, some uh, kind of factual state of affairs um in in which um something is crimson but not red or is a, a copy of who's who but not um red um but but I think that 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 we really need to keep the, the, the as were well, those those modal contents separate. And if we just if we just stick with non-modal contents, uh, then I then I think the, um, the 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 parallel is still is still there. Um, now to come on to your um, defense of, of humanism. Um, well, there are a few things that, uh, that I would like to say. I mean, one is, of course, with with humanism, there's, he also thinks that the that the um, the distinction between relations of um, ideas and and matters of fact uh, that it it completely correlates with the distinction between necessary and uh, and contingent, um, and and so if uh, and so if the the re relations of ideas matter of fact correlated with a priori a posteriori, it would mean that um, he would he would be running up again, and then we combine that with his claims ab about the, the the modal distinction. We, um, he would be in trouble with Kripke's uh, examples uh, of the. Um, necessary a posteriori and the contingent a priori now i mean you you weren't really um pushing the the modal aspect so um so one so i want to to put that um on uh, on one side um i mean oh, i think <clears throat> i mean one thing that's worth 
thinking about is to what extent um, Hume's, you know, if we, ta if we take, the, if we just consider the Humean distinction on the, um, as it were, as it were, conceptual epistemological side, how explanatory the notion of a, a relation of ideas uh, is. And, um, and so, I mean, one problem is that, you know, if we just took that literally as um, any kind of um, r relation of I ideas uh, a at all, that then, I mean, a a any matter of fact can be dressed up a as a relation of ideas. I mean, so that, you know, if we... Um, You know, if we took, took something like, um, you know, some completely um, contingent um, generalization of the form, uh, you know, all, all Fs are Gs, um, it, that does correspond, I mean, that's, that's equivalent to um, the extension of the idea of F is a subset of the extension of the um, uh, idea of G. And and so it, so it, you know, given um, that those kind of connections, it, you know, anything will end up will being it, end up being equivalent to a relation um, of uh, ideas, um, and and so it, so it would it would come out much more um broadly but um you know and and so you, you might think well then really the, the the phrase relation of uh ideas isn't isn't doing um the 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 work that uh the explanatory work um that that Hume uh wants it uh to to do and we could um uh, and we could impose some further restriction, but I, I suspect that that um, it would um, it would be a would, would need to bring in either some modal or some epistemological element. So we could, I mean, we could talk about whether it, it was a, a necessary r relation between the ideas, but but that that isn't going to help because. Um, that then you know there, there actually is a, a necessary um, relation between the idea of water and the idea of H two O. It's not it's not a, a priori, but there's a necessary relation between them, um, and um, and so that doesn't seem to to to, to get at, at what's um, what's wanted. Um, and you know, if if we simply said, well, look, really, what Hume is talking about just is that what we can um, know by uh, know by thinking. Um, then, so that as it were, it's it's the notion of the a priori that's explaining um, the um, the relation of I what's meant by a relation of ideas. Um, I, I I I don't think that that is. Um, well, it's, it, it's uh, I mean, of course, we, 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 we then, uh, again, we, 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 we run into issues about the contingent um, a priori, I mean, of course, we, we, which are, uh, uh, that isn't quite what we were meaning to do, but, but I mean, for example, you know, if, if, you, t if you take the sort of case that I was talking about earlier, the, that um, the that um, the example of the contingent a priori of of, um, of thinking um, thinking happens or something like that. Um, it you know it seems that that in some sense um, that that. It, we might want to say that 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 was that's something that we we can know um a priori um because um 
it's um the you know but, but but by just as it were if we just accept it on the grounds that accepting it, it will guarantee that it's true but it doesn't seem that that there is what i imagine hume would want to call a relation of ideas between as it were the idea of um thinking and the idea of of that of, of as were having to be of happening in the sense of that that having to be instantiated or or something like um like that i mean of, of course there's a lot more to be said but i think one one thing that is notable about the distinction between relations of ideas and matters of fact is that it's that's clearly presented as a distinction in between as it were contents or propositions or um or thoughts or well, i mean whatever would term we would want to use i mean uh, roughly so roughly speaking it's a distinction between the things that are known or justified um r- rather than between um the the ways in which um they're known or justified and and i think that is that is not going to line up with the a priori a posteriori distinction simply because um there are there are some contents or whatever we want to call them which can be known a priori and uh can be known um a posteriori so so i mean a simple example of that is if you have a um the disjunction of of something which is just thoroughly um contingent i mean and and a posteriori let's say um let's take the the uh, there are mountains in china um and and the other one is a sort of paradigm of the a priori let's say that it's um 17 squared equals 289 and that now we take the um the, the content either there are mountains in china um or um 17 squared it, it equals 289 um then w- i mean one way of knowing that is by by going to china and seeing some mountains there and then and then you you know a posteriori that there are mountains uh in china um and and so you can then deduce that either there are mountains in china or 17 squared equals 289 just by the uh standard rule of um or inter- introduction and then that's that's a posteriori knowledge because it's it's derived from something a posteriori um whereas um you can also you can also know that disjunction by actually calculating that 17 squared equals 289 and from that you can deduce that either there are mountains in china or 17 squared e- equals 289 and so that's knowing it a priori because it's just knowing it by a mathematical calculation and a, and then a further step of logical uh, disjunction so the very same thing can be known either a priori or a posteriori by any kind of normal standards of applying those terms and that means that the the distinction between um n- knowing or being justified a priori and and knowing or being justified a posteriori it just can't line up with a distinction between the things that are known and uh, um or justified because um it that won't allow for the the um the cases where the very same thing can be known in either way i mean there's a lot more in what you said but uh, th- those are some initial thoughts anyway <laughs> okay. uh hello uh, technologies of mr mello uh great has high fast wait some minutes i you want prof- professor shu zhong qin to give some short comments and ask question because he translated uh, teams 
article about the distinction. Okay, so. <clears throat> Yes. Okay. Thank Professor Tanborg for giving me this opportunity to exchange with Professor Williamson directly. And thank Professor Williamson for your wonderful talk. Okay, I read your book, The Philosophy of Philosophy, and your 2019 paper a few years ago. And I published one paper in Philosophy Forum on your challenges to the primary. And a culturary distinction. After hearing today's lecture, I learned more about this issue. Thank you very much. However, I still have some questions and I wanted to know your opinion about them. First, when we talk about the distinction between a priori and a culturary, we usually talk them in terms of ways of justification rather than ways of discovery. However, you are talking about the distinction of ways of knowing. So my first question is, what's the relation between ways of knowing and the ways of discovery? Will you also object the justification discovery distinction or do you understand ways of knowing different from ways of discovery? Yeah, that's my first question. My second question is, yeah. when you present your challenge to the a priori and a priori distinction, your example, all crap instances I read is the example with conceptual connection. Of course, one can also apply conceptual connection to real cases. However, I cannot say how typical open Observatory knowledge could also be obtained by imagination, such as this particular skirt is green, or just your example, this copy of who's the who is red. This is my first, my second question. My third question is about the analytic sensitive distinction and understanding of language. You seem to be very tolerant about misunderstanding. Someone have very big misunderstanding with some concepts, but you still took them as understand the language. But ordinarily, we would say small misunderstanding is more departure from understanding, and big misunderstanding is big departure from understanding. And by the way, your your view on constitutional rules in knowledge and its limits is also hard to follow. It seems that you take norms of, knowledge norms of assertion both as constitutive and can be violated without making assertion. However, ordinarily we will say a constitutional rule cannot be violated in that way. And my this is my third question. My fourth question is, is a small one. How percussion understands your policy proposal as replacing the traditional a posteriori and posteriori distinction with armchair and unanswered distinction? Does he have some misunderstanding about you or is this your Political proposal, or do you have some other political proposal in mind? That's all of my questions. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you. So, um, yeah, I'll go through. So, the, the first one was if I um, understood it was between ways of uh, discovering and ways of knowing is is that a, is that a, meant yes, to be a yeah. big distinction? Yeah. So uh, no, it, because I think I think that discovering uh, something is coming to know it. So it's, it's so a, a way. It's just we're just talking about in talking about ways of discovering. We're just talking about ways of coming to know. Um, 
Of course, there's, then there's, a, there's a slight extra thing about ways of maintaining your knowledge once you've got it. But but really, there is there's there's no important uh, difference that, that is being um, marked uh, there. Um, then I'm not I'm not quite sure if if I fully got what what your second question was, but it, but it just on the issue of conceptual connections i i just don't think that the that the, is any w well defined notion of 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 a conceptual connection as opposed to a non um conceptual uh connection i mean that that um in all, with all of these examples when you know, we're not really thinking about the concepts. Um, we're just thinking, um, you know, we're using, if, if, if we were to talk about concepts at all, we would say that we were using the concepts to just to think about what the concepts are, are referred to. Um, and, and then, um, and then if we want to say, well, what's the difference between a, and And so, you know, even with the most, contingent and a posteriori um, <coughs> examples um, we're still we, we, you know for the, as I was saying in response to Matt we can still kind of um, if you like find an equivalent way of saying what we have learned in terms of a relation between concepts and so that's some kind of conceptual uh, connection um, and um, and so I I don't, uh, you know, and of course we, you know, we we, we store all, all, all sorts of connections between concepts, but those may be contingent uh, connections and and so on. So I, I, I don't, I, I just don't think that the the notion of a conceptual connection is is really uh, one that we can do much with. Um, then on the. On the third issue, which which was about conditions of understanding and the an analytic synthetic distinction, and um, and then you you were talking as were am, am I saying that that it, it all depends on the difference between a small misunderstanding and a um, a large misunderstanding? Um, of course. The, the notion, if we call it a misunderstanding, we're, we're already implying that the person doesn't um, properly um, uh, understand. Um, I think of, one difficulty with the English word understand is that it's used both for, as it were, some, what we might roughly call um, linguistic competence and for theoretical understanding. Um, and and so when we start talking about let's say deviant logicians that are misunderstanding something, it's unclear whether we're talking about the, the linguistic competence or about theoretical misunderstanding. Um, so um, what what I'm if we're talking about um, l linguistic competence, then I, I think that that with with the kind of deviant logicians that, and deviant theorists that I've been talking about, um, th they have full linguistic competence, and so in the purely linguistic sense, there is no misunderstanding. They're not. I mean, it's not that they have a small misunderstanding; it's that they have no misunderstanding. Um, but if we were talking ab about, as it were, theoretical um, understanding. Um, then I, you know, I think um, all, all kinds of um, errors, you know, constitute, you know, just a, any mistaken belief can constitute, in, in a way, a misunderstanding. It's a, a failure to um, uh, uh, to understand in in some broader sense. I mean, so that you know, if if I, you know, if I see someone and I'm I, I misidentify them, um, then. Then as I've misunderstood who they are, and and so so any kind of error is um, would count as a, 
a, a misunderstanding from ultimately from that point of view. And and so um, so I think we need to distinguish these as it were the, the linguistic competence from theoretical understanding and. Uh, once we've made that distinction, it, 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 we're not talking. It's, we're not talking about the difference between, you know, small uh, um, understand, small misunderstandings and large ones. I mean, of course, you know, it's. I mean, people can have qu quite large uh, errors and still be understanding, you know, a a, um, a, a word w w with its with its correct uh, meaning. I mean, at some point, they 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 they, they may simply not be they may be so deviant in, in their use of a term that they no longer count as having linguistic competence with it. So so we, we could talk about, as it were, small versus large deviant deviations from, if you like, average use. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I, th I think there it is to some extent a, a matter of degree. But I think, but I also think that the cases that I'm talking about are cases of pe people who who very very clearly have um, linguistic competence with the relevant terms. I mean, they're not marginal cases. Um, then the fourth question that you were asking me about was on the distinction between armchair and non-armchair knowledge. That's that's not meant to be a clearer um, distinction th than the distinction between a, a priori and a posteriori. That's just meant to be, you know, a, a, a very casual uh, distinction that uh, that we w that we might make, and where um, by by calling it that, we're we're just um, making it much more open that we're not put, we're, we're not putting much weight on this distinction so yeah i know some some readers have thought that i was actually trying to offer some new and much better distinction than the than the previous one but that was not at all my uh in, intention okay thank you mr mello uh please shortly okay over your camera Huh? Mr. Waiting. Oh, yeah. Are you talking with me? Yeah. yeah yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, I, do, so I don't know how to pronounce your name. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, 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 really, thank you uh, very much uh, to Wuhan University. But give me a second. Can you please give me just a second? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, again, uh, really thank you very much to Wuhan University uh, for all these weekends uh, of readings uh, with the philosopher Williamson. Uh, Professor Williamson, I, I am honored to have the opportunity to ask you a question again. I don't know if you remember me, but I asked you a question related to this topic in the conference you gave for the Edinburgh University Philosophy Society, uh, Knowledge by Proof and Knowledge by Sight. Uh, that time, I told you that I agree with your criticisms of internalisms for the most part. And now, after these readings, I uh, reaffirm it. Uh, so my question is, does the problem with the a priori differ from the way uh, we look at it uh, if the position is internal or external in ep epistemological terms, it seems to me that the problem is not the distinction, but the way uh, it is assumed. Is that right? Um, well, I, so I, I'm not, I think the problem is with the distinction. Um, so you know, I'm. Um, so of course, my 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 preferred um, a, a approach is is a broadly externalist um, one, and w w within the externalist uh, framework, um, there's not. You know, I, I mean, the, well, the, the, the criticisms that I've been making are, are criticisms that can be made within that framework and so they so they do um apply to um the 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 distinction um 
itself. I mean, of course, I, I, I mean, I have been making some some distinctions um, which might sound similar to the a priori, um, a posteriori distinction, like I've been distinguishing between online and offline processing, for, for example. Um, and, you know, so that's, I take that to be a genuine distinction, but I don't think it can serve the purposes of the a priori, a posteriori uh, distinction, because it, it, it just has to do with, with what the cur current mode of processing is, but we might be processing things that, as it were, in, you know, if we look further back to where we, we got them from, you know, what were, um, would, would differed. So, so it's not really, a, I don't regard that as a substitute um, distinction. Um, and, um, and from the, I mean, I suppose you, you could also ask whether the, um the distinction works if you if you take um an a more internalist uh, approach and and of course you know i mean an internalist like Bogosian, you know is happy with the distinction um but you know but the, but I, I i i mean in my view the the internalist framework um, is is so uh, pro problematic that, that 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 you know that's not really much much consolation for the the distinction. And you know if if you in fact if you look at the at the way that um, that Bigosian tries to draw the distinction between the a priori and the a posteriori in in the the book you'll i mean he he does make some efforts in that direction but it, it it's it's actually it turns out that you need to um to to make a kind of list of which types of experience are you know are are relevant and which are not and so it it, it actually could, even within his own framework um it comes out as a rather unnatural uh, distinction. Um, so I, you know, I just don't, I, I don't think that there is a good distinction there. And that, and I think that, um, you know, al although the argument might go differently, if you were a really hardline internalist, I, I, th I think it's not, it's not easy even for them to draw the distinction. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Professor, open your camera. I'll ask you a question. Final question. Hmm. Uh, okay, uh, thanks for your uh, interesting lecture. I have only one quick question in mind. Uh, you claim that uh, the distinction between priori and uh, posteriori is superficial. So uh, do you mean that or uh, 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 your list can imply that uh, the distinction between priori condition and uh, posteriori necessary is also, super is also superficial? Um. Well, so I, I, I think the, um, the distinction, the modal distinction between the necessary and the contingent is, is a better distinction. And, and so, um, the, and so the, the so the, as it were, the, 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 we won't have examples of, um, the, the, a priori of the um, of the contingent a priori, which are, which are deeply deeply similar to examples of the necessary a posteriori, because because on one side they'll be contingent, on the other side that they'll be necessary, and that's a really that's a deep d distinction, not a superficial uh, one. Of course, I think it, it's true that w once we think that the categories of the a priori. And the a posteriori are um, are not such interesting categories. Th then, um, th then the uh, these examples uh, that Kripke gives may may be a bit less interesting examples because because they the, the examples um, have to do with um, the. 
you know, with categories that are not very um, good ones. But um, I think I think that um, probably even even when we've I mean, I think we, I think there are kind of interesting aspects of Kripke's uh, I- examples, which which don't act, in fact depend on the um, you know on, on using the the a priori a posteriori distinction. For example, in the case of the the, the necessary a posteriori, but one thing that his examples show is that. Um, necessary and contingent truths can be known in extremely similar ways um because you know we've got the the we we the way in which we know that water equals h2o is very very similar to the way in which uh we know that the the stuff that you know that comes out of our um taps and bathrooms and so on is um uh, is H two O, and or that the stuff that that runs in in rivers and seas is uh, is H two O. But whereas it's necessary that water is H two O, it's contingent that the stuff that is is in rivers uh, is H two O. And so, so th- th- there, what we've got is uh, two propositions whose modal status is quite different, but they can be known in more in almost exactly the same way. And, and and that kind of lesson of that example um, is um, is one that doesn't depend on putting weight on the a priori a posteriori distinction. It just you know dep- just dep- I mean what it's showing is that the way the, the, the way of knowing um, may, may be similar even though the modal status is quite different. And you could probably use the, the the examples of the contingent a priori to make a similar point so i think in a way the inter- even the interest of the examples can be kind of rescued from the the um the superficiality of the, the a priori a posteriori distinction okay uh, i'm sorry i have to close the discussion section i will give a short uh, concluding remark Yes. Mm. Uh, I have to repeat. Uh, last year at PK University, I invited Professor Timson Williamson to deliver uh, 10 online lectures to talk about how to do philosophy. That is the third of philosophy. That event was quite influential. This year at Wuhan University, we also invited Professor Kimberson Williamson again to the other eight lectures to talk about how does he himself actually do philosophy. So they are quite influential, although not as influential as the last series of lectures. Maybe, perhaps, because of uh, their techniques, novelty, themes, that is the difficulty to form. Uh, uh, for some uh, clinical or audience, uh, when talk about uh, identity and discrimination, uh, necessity, uh, uh, how the factors, something like that, maybe have some difficult follow. Yes. Uh, Timothy Williamson uh, uh, delivered, this time uh, delivered eight lectures. Lecture one, my, prepar- my preparation for doing philosophy. Lecture two, identity and discrimination. Uh, lecture three, abstentionism. Lecture four, knowledge first. Lecture five, reflections on philosophy. Uh, lecture six, 
necessities, uh, lecture seven, counterfactuals, uh, lecture eight, the a priori and uh, a posteriori distinction. In this lectures, Pro Professor Williamson focus on the process of how he developed his ideas and the theories about this topics, not on the presentation and the interpretation of key ideas in these topics. From this kind of talks, we can know how he actually do does his philosophy. We also invited eight interlocutors to make comments and ask questions. Uh, Mr. Zhu Hui Lan, uh, a PhD student at Wuhan University, Professor Liu Xiaofei at Wuhan University, Professor Wang Wenfang from Shandong University, Associate Professor Ye Ru from Wuhan University, Professor Li, Li Rong from Wuhan University, Associate Professor Peter Fellow K. Anu from Wuhan University, Professor Su Qinghui from Shandong University, Associate Professor Matt Luz from Wuhan University. Professor Li Dianlai, the Dean of School of Philosophy, Wuhan University, made an opening, uh, opening address to this series of lectures. I myself and uh, Professor Chen Rong, my colleague at Wuhan University, moderate these eight lectures and discussions. Many philosophic colleagues students and other friends from inside and outside of China attend these lectures. Every lecture attracted thousands or hundreds of audience. This quite good. So we can say these lectures are influential philosophy philosophical events in China. I really appreciate Professor Timson Williams's challenging and the deep thinking lectures. I really appreciate eight invited interlocutors insightful comments and questions. I really appreciate all the audience friends to join us and pay your attention to these lectures and discussions. Thank all of you very much. What we can learn from Professor Timson, Professor Timson Williams's lectures. I myself like to make the following Summarizations. Uh, at first effect, first, uh, Professor Williamson is born in an Oxford academic family and well educated by his Oxford professors and the atmosphere of philosophical uh, research over there. In some sense, he is lucky. <laughs> he is lucky. Uh, between uh, 2007 and 8, I was an academic visitor invited by Professor Tim Timson Williams at Oxford. In my interview to him, I once said, Yo, it's just early two years than me. But right now, you are internationally uh, recognized uh, as a philosopher. Get an 
many important recognition from the inside and outside of United Kingdom. I'm but I'm nothing in the philosophical uh, international circle of philosophy. Even have zero publication uh, uh, in very recognized English journals. Mm. I also said uh, all of all of this difference, uh, not not all of this difference are cheap, uh, are can be uh, reduced to my laziness and the stupidness. <laughs> also, my the, the difference of family background and education <laughs> background also play uh, a big role. Also, in this sense, we can learn from uh, hey, uh, Tim Professor, uh, uh, Professor Williamson, uh, in some sense, in this, at this point, he is quite lucky. Okay. But uh, two, he is very confident and independent thinker, even from teenager, teenage down to his old age, uh, uh, very ob obviously. Hmm. In his teenage years, when read the interview by such leading British philosophers, for example, Peter Sturson, A.J. Air, Carl Burple, uh, he said, I felt sure I had it in me to play my own part in such a conversation. Uh, in his undergraduate stage, A.J. Air is a Wickham professor of logic at Oxford. Uh, Williamson thinks his position is good. Uh, he himself likes it. I want to take it in future. <laughs> I, mean, I really take this position in 2000 years. Uh, at his first stage, he didn't like the philosophical style of Donald uh, uh, Davidson quite fashionable at Oxford in that time. He also disagreed with the anti-realism and the ob objections to classic logic of Michael Dammit. The supervisor of his different education. Yes, very brave and very independent. Uh, he said, uh, in his undergraduate or maybe beginning of the defair uh, stage, lively, I felt ready to develop my own idea all by myself. I didn't want to follow the ideas of any other philosopher, not even critically. I was not looking for a teacher just for the opportunity Total and my own says this idea, I think, runs through his whole academic career. Also, I remind every uh, friend to take notice of this fact. His many later developed and the influential philosophical doctrines are actually originated from his independent thinking as an undergraduate at Oxford. So, uh, from his talk, his uh, many ideas are originated from his thinking as an uh, undergraduate at, at Oxford. So, three. In doing philosophy, Professor Williamson is very creative, develop, developing many new controversial and influential philosophical doctrines. 
for example, in Vegas, he has epistemicism. In epistemology, he has the knowledge forced epistemology. Liu Meta philosophy and philosophical methodology. For example, he is really emphasized uh, on abduction. Advocate, uh, you advocate abductive philosophy, uh, metaphysics of modernity, necessitism, uh, Liu thinking about the semantics and the heuristics of counterfactuals. Liu said insights about the a priori and the a posteriori distinction. So, uh, in doing his philosophy, Professor Williamson really used classic logic, modern logic, epistemic logic, the logic of counterfactuals, probability theory, and others as his philosophical tools. And also deeply think about the philosophical questions about these logics and theories. He might not be counted as a technically constructed logician. But heavily logical impressed philosopher uh, in his uh, philosophical research study, he heavily used modern logic as uh, the frame, as the tool, as the fundamental, something like that. Yes. Uh, Hi, Professor Timson, uh, Timothy Williamson, books on pure philosophy. For example, metaphysics, epistemology, philosophy of logic and language, not ethics, not aesthetics, not applied philosophy, not social philosophy of all philosophy of life, not philosophy concerns about the current issue of contemporary, uh, contemporary society. In sum, he is completely academic philosopher, not a social philosopher. Yes. Answer. Awesome. And I know, uh, Prof Professor Williamson always works very hard. Oh, almost work, uh, works in his office, even at the whole weekend, uh, uh, because I stay with one year with him. Mm. There is no easy success in every field especially in philosophy. No hard work, no success. Uh, we cannot uh, only blue uh, your genius and your talents. Uh, you must believe, also believe, hard work and hard work. Genius, talents, plus Hard work may be the way to the success. Uh, I think uh, Pro Professor Williamson showed his way to success, genius, talents, and hard work. Uh, I also have to emphasize that we must have the similar attitude to uh, Williamson's philosophy, just like he had that attitude to other philosophers' works. For example, Donald uh, Davidson, his supervisor 
Michael Tammy and many others, uh, I think this way. If you agree with uh, Winnipeg's positions, but not so, maybe, I still have some further work uh, to do, then you develop his ideas and positions. If you disagree with him, then you construct your argument and your theory is dead. So, we do philosophy. Uh, we uh, take Williams, we take, we take deal with Williams' philosophy, just like he does philosophy. Uh, just like he does to other great philosophers' jobs. Yes. Yes, by the way, I have, I will say, the Chinese translation of the transcript of this series of these lectures by Professor Timothy Williamson and the following discussions were published for me. This job, I give this job uh, to be responsible to Professor Shu Zhao Qin uh, because he, he is responsible for the, 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 the book uh, about the last series uh, of uh, lectures. I read the whole manuscript. Uh, I think the quality is quite good. So I let him to take responsibility to this lecture so this new box, okay. Uh, there are certainly some other characteristics of uh, uh, Timothy Williams' philosophical research. I'm sure about this, but these days I'm terribly busy. You walk into many different things. Uh, just finish this concluding remarks before and even in this lecture. So, let's go to the preparation for this. I'm sorry for this. So, finally, I want to give my sincere thanks again to Professor Timothy Williamson, our eight interlocutors, all the colleagues and friends attending these lectures. Uh, also, also, Hello, International Office of Wuhan University. Hello, they gave the financial support to this series of uh, lectures. Uh, hey, gave, gave me the money. Mm. Also, the School of Philosophy of Wuhan University. Uh, many thanks. Uh, bye bye. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Professor Williams, you would like to say something? Oh, conclude. Oh, conclude. Well, I would. I would like to thank thank you um, and and all the um, interlocutors for, who've all been raising very challenging and uh, and interesting. Uh, questions and issues for for me to discuss. It's it's been a pleasure to to give these lectures and and to communicate with um, a, a wide audience in China. So and of course you without you these would never have have happened. So uh, thank you very much for those remarks. Yeah yeah yeah. Thank all of you. Uh, we close this series of lectures. Okay. Bye bye.